I just got back from a team trip to go check out our Coaster in a Box prototype. The engineering team has made a ton of new upgrades that I cannot wait to share with you. Before I do that, I wanna take you under the hood of our coaster and show you some of the engineering that makes it possible. I promise you, what's up next is worth the wait. So we had really two goals with this prototype of Coaster in a Box. One, we wanted to make sure that it functioned properly. Uh, we wanted to make sure that it was safe. The other thing was that we wanted to make sure we could keep the cost down for a prototype. We have a licensed structural engineer on the team who helps us with all of our ride designs. Once we've got a layout, we work with our structural engineer to determine the different sizing of the members, such as the railings, the frequency of the supports, uh, even the types of screws that we use. So one of the things that makes this prototype different from the production coaster in a box is the actual rail specifications themselves. Now these rail specifications were defined by Little Thunder because we're using Little Thunder's chassis and bogies. So that is using inch and a half rail diameter along with a 30 inch gauge. On a roller coaster track, you've obviously got the weight of the track that is supporting the ride vehicle. And that weight comes under the rails, gets distributed through the tie, and then comes down into this column. For our structure columns, we use a wood A-frame. Uh, two reasons for that. One, really cost effective for a prototype. And two, it's really flexible. If we wanted to move something, like, you know, maybe maybe we don't want the support here. Maybe we want it on the, the tie over here. We can, we can move things. The final production version will have a bit smaller gauge, but will have a two inch rail diameter, along with a large three inch spine. This ensures that each track piece is rigid on its own, ensures we need less supports, and also ensures that there's just less deflection when you're coming around these turns at a high speed. Once the weight comes through here, we actually have the column going all the way to the ground, and then two uh, diagonal pieces that help with the track's rotation in this direction. If you can imagine, the coaster is coming down and it's actually applying forces in this direction. The weight is being distributed along this angle of piece of wood, it's pushing into the ground, and then actually the weight of this footer is helping prevent it from tilting up in this direction. Once all the weight get brought down to the ground, that's great, but there are additional forces, which is the coaster moving forward and backward this way. We went through and we put cross bracing. What this really does is ensure that the bottoms of the track, the bottoms of the trusses stay down or stay up. It all create these triangles that create a very rigid structure. Our production version of Coaster in a Box uses steel supports. And there are a couple of reasons why we use steel supports. One, we're able to get away with fewer of them. So you're not taking as much of a footprint on your ground. From just like a practicality longevity standpoint, steel is gonna last much longer than wood. Again, all of these members were tested and they were designed specifically to be able to take the weight plus. So we're not designing just to the weight of the ride vehicle and the force of the ride vehicle. We're doing it at a factor of safety to the industry standards. Let's look at the ride vehicle. This was actually built off of the wheelbase of the Little Thunder chassis, but we modified it for the coaster in a box application. So we added this entire top part out of one inch square tubing, and we also completely reoriented the shape of the ride vehicle to allow for the smaller track layout. With those modifications to the Little Thunder chassis, we added these big footrests, and this allows for the person in the back to be comfortable. And we got these racing seats off of Amazon along with the four-point harnesses. There's a reason these are used in like race cars and things like that. And that is because they, they keep you very snug and they hold you in place. So one of the unique things that is pretty apparent about this ride vehicle is this very large center section. So what's in that section is our four batteries that run the ride vehicle. Batteries are one of the heaviest parts of it. So we want to make sure that they're low to the ground, pretty much the lowest point it can be to ensure that you have a low center of gravity. We have four batteries in this ride vehicle. They're 72 volt, 20 amp hour each, which means that they can put out roughly 14,000 watts of power, which is an incredible amount of power. That, that ended up being so powerful so we ended up only using three of those batteries because we just instantly do a burnout and just be too aggressive. It's, it's a nice problem to have where it's too powerful for the application. Pretty much we took inspiration from electric cars and we realized that it just made a lot of sense if it was self-powered. 
So what that allows us to do is we are able to make it completely smart and completely automated. Instead of having you know multiple motors along it with big, powerful you know circuit breakers, you can instead just have it all localized on it. The heart of the whole electrical system is the control box. This is where all of our electrical system is located, such as a PLC. Uh, there's a Raspberry Pi in here that's running a server called Ignition. There's also some safety controllers in here that uh, function with the emergency stop that's on the outside of the box, as well as one where the rider can hit if something were to go wrong. So you may notice these big aluminum blocks. These are the controllers that actually power the motors for this ride. Because these are brushless motors, they require a computer that actually runs them. So these controllers we just got off of Amazon, and now it's because we need the fast shipping for the fast turnaround time of the Mark Rover project. This is the proximity sensor. It uh, detects anything that has metal that passes by it, and it's how we know where the train is at as it goes around the track. Each of these is rated for 3,000 watts, but they can actually peak output around 3,700 watts. The whole system can output about 14 kilowatts of power, which is a lot. Currently, we are only running off of three out of the four motors because it's just too powerful, but it, there are four controllers and four motors just because it leaves that option to be able to be run off of that. Another very obvious feature is this big sprocket and chain system. This is the sprocket that actually runs the tire and the wheel that is underneath this assembly, and these each run to the motors. This idler sprocket ensures that the chain wraps around both motors to ensure you get good contact on their sprockets. If you don't have this, well, half of this is only goes straight across, you have the potential for the chain to jump the sprockets. So by having this idler here ensures proper contact, it ensures you can put a ton amount of force into that wheel. So in order for a coaster in a box for the ride vehicle to be able to launch itself, it needs something to apply the wheel to. And that's this drive rail. Similar to our wooden trusses, uh, this is made out of wood. It was a lot easier to do it in the short time span that we had. In our production model, this is actually made out of steel, but it also will have this kind of grip tape um, on top of it to provide it a little bit more friction. Mark Roper had certain requirements. One of them was the fact that we had to go up over nine and a half feet tall so that he could walk under it, but we had to do it in a very short space. So because of that, we had to pretty much make the drive rail wrap around and go up over the top. Knowing that we had to go up over nine and a half feet, there are some kinetic energy calculations you can make to know how fast you have to accelerate to make it up that height. With those calculations, those are the things that define how powerful our motors were, how many motors we use, what type of batteries we use, and very prominently, what angle this bank's turn is. The bank's turn was also its own calculation, and that is that was defined by how tight the radius is and how fast we were intending it to go. The drive rail works super well, super easy to build on these straight sections where all you have to do is keep the relative height of the drive rail at the same at the same height. Once you start getting into these bank curves, it gets a little interesting, and that's where the carpenters have a lot of fun. As the drive rail is banking, we're actually warping the wood in order to keep the drive rail parallel with the rails. We weren't entirely sure how fast the ride vehicle would be going leaving the station, and so we assumed it was going at the speed necessary to go over that hill, so we banked it aggressively accordingly. Now the bank angle is defined by a commonly used industry standard formula. And what that formula does is it makes it so that the coaster is actually more comfortable while you're taking that angle at a high speed. Now the thing with roller coasters is roller coasters, in a way, don't, they don't really steer. They actually just kind of go with the angle of the track. The ideal bank angle is one where as you're going at it at max speed, it doesn't feel like you're being whipped around it. It feels like you're comfortably going in that direction and that you're just naturally just being forced back but not being whipped in a specific direction.